The external anatomy of the heart is where we will begin. Understanding this will allow us to better understand the structure function relationship of the heart and allow us to become stronger clinicians. Oh, you don't believe me? Let me show you. When a surgeon opens a patient's chest and removes the pericardium, they will begin to see the external features of the heart. This external anatomy gives them insight on where they would need to cut and what vessels and structures they would need to avoid. You'll notice that on the epicardial surface of the heart, there is quite a bit of adipose tissue. Some adipose here is very normal. Normally, these fat deposits are typically a local energy source for the heart. When there's too much or too little, that can often be reflective of poor health in the patient. Starting at the base, we first see the major arteries and veins coming off superiorly. Here's the aorta, the superior vena cava, and the pulmonary trunk. As we move down, we can see the two atria, and then as we move towards the apex, we will have the two ventricles. We can start to make out the location of the four chambers on the external surface of the heart. The right border of the heart is formed by the right atrium, which we can make out because of this atrial appendage here. The atrial appendages are also referred to as auricles. Where else in the body have we heard this term? The external ear, right? Early anatomists believed these auricles looked like the external ear. Inferior to the right atrium, we will find the external surface of the right ventricle. The left border of the heart is formed by a small portion of the left atrium and the left ventricle. Again, we can make out the left atrial appendage. Then the inferior border of the heart is formed by the inferior wall of the right ventricle. On the anterior surface of the heart, we will be able to make out different sulci or grooves. In each of these sulci, we'll find branches of coronary circulation. The coronary circulation is responsible for supplying the heart tissue with the oxygen and nutrients it needs to continue to work efficiently, while also removing metabolic wastes. The first one we can see here is part of the coronary sulcus. This sulcus denotes the separation between the atria and the ventricles. And this is also where we will find arteries for the coronary circulation, specifically the right coronary artery on the right side and the circumflex artery branching towards the left. Also on the anterior surface, we can find the anterior interventricular sulcus, which separates the left and right ventricles. An arterial branch from the left coronary artery, called the left anterior descending artery, runs through this sulcus. This artery supplies the anterior muscle wall of the left ventricle and two thirds of the muscle wall of the interventricular septum. So if there's a clog in the artery, it can lead to a very severe myocardial infarction, which is why the left anterior descending artery has been nicknamed the Widowmaker. <coughs> Clinically, the right coronary artery, the circumflex artery, and the left anterior descending account for most occlusions in the coronary circulation. This anatomy is important when treating patients who have suffered heart attacks or coronary artery disease. Now let's flip the heart to the posterior side. On the posterior surface of the heart, we will see the posterior interventricular sulcus, which again is denoting the location of the interventricular septum or where the right and left ventricles are separated. On the posterior side of the heart, within the coronary sulcus, we can make out the coronary sinus, which is the larger vein of the coronary circuit that brings the oxygen-poor blood back to the right atrium. Here we have the pulmonary veins, which is where oxygen-rich blood will return from the lungs to the left atrium. Now that we have explored the external anatomy, we have a better idea of how surgeons make plans for cutting into patients. Understanding this anatomy is key when we are looking to transplant hearts, fix and replace heart valves, as well as placing stents in coronary vessels after a myocardial infarction. Thanks for watching. For more educational videos, subscribe to the West Coast University channel below.